This time of year, you double down on cheer. So does Dunkin'. That's why they have twice the signature lattes with minty peppermint mocha and creamy toasted white chocolate, both handcrafted with rich espresso. Grab one today. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. With the Planet Fitness Black Card, you don't just get a great workout. You get a great perk out because your membership is packed with perks. For $1 down and $24.99 a month, you'll get perks like access to any of our 2,400 clean and spacious locations. Bring your friend anytime and both work out with tons of equipment that'll give you that big fitness energy relax in the black card spa and more work out and perk out with the pf black card join for just one dollar down and 24.99 a month see home club for details historia canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the canyan Kaheka first nation Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where we talk about literature, culture, politics, and society in general in this snowy land that we call Canada. And every once in a while, we have uh, authors on the show who like to talk about their upcoming or recently released works. And today, I'm happy to talk to Wayne McCrory, McCrory, sorry who is a biologist specializing in the study of wild horses, bears, and western toads. And he is here with us today to talk about his latest release, The Wild Horses of the Chilcotin. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I should have looked it up uh, before we started recording, but um, yeah, welcome to the show, Wayne. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be here and to talk about the Chilcotin wild horses. Chilcotin. Okay, good to know. Um But just to get our audience more familiar with the book that we're going to be talking about, can you actually tell them what specifically you cover in the book and perhaps why you think it was important to address the topic in such a way? Well, I went up to the BC Chilcotin where I've been doing research for a long time to study grizzly bears about 20 years ago in a beautiful, pristine lodgepole pine plateau called the Brittany Triangle. And I went to do a grizzly study. That's part of my profession. And there were all these wild horses. And I wondered why they were still there, because I, at that time, as a biologist, I regarded them as feral alien animals. And that was reinforced by living in the Galapagos Islands years ago, when I experienced how destructive feral animals can be. But slowly as time went on, you know, they were very incredibly beautiful and wild. And it was amazing to see them working with the Chilcotin First Nations elders and seeing they weren't overeating the grasslands and overpopulating. I had, light bulbs started to go off my head. And so I started uh, doing more research on them. And the more I looked, uh, the deeper I dug, the more fascinating it became. And Uh, Eventually, my report uh, recommended the area be not only protected for grizzly bears, but become North America's first wild horse preserve, which is what what the Chilcotin Nation did. And and so we started a lot more research because of that. And so the whole thing just grew and grew. It just mushroomed in many directions. And eventually, I realized that, you know, they were we didn't have many left in Canada. They'd been mostly eliminated conflicts with ranchers and through bounty hunts. And I realized being a conservationist and activist and helping protect many areas in BC for grizzly bears that, you know, they needed, the public needs to know more about them and they need to be protected. So I started writing and the book sort of wrote itself. Yeah. It's really interesting. And can you, Take us a bit through some of the highlights of these wild horses' existence in North America, because I think they don't exist only in British Columbia, right? But um, can you take us a little bit through how they got here and how perhaps some of the major uh, populations uh, that have inhabited North America have kind of interacted with these horses? Well, it got really interesting because... Uh, like I say, I thought they were uh, alien species that uh, mm-hmm. somewhere else, but I found out that they're the most studied mammal on the planet in terms of their evolution, and they evolved over 30 million years um, in North America. North America is their birthplace, starting from the diminutive dawn horse way back when, 
and and survived through all the different changes of the planet and different ages with dinosaurs and so on down. And the last horse is um, what's called the Yukon horse, and it survived in an ice-free area in the northern Yukon and, and south of the last glacial sheets, uh, in, uh, what's now the United States. And for reasons we don't understand, they went extinct 5,000 years ago. So they were they were gone, and but they had uh, migrated to Eurasia across the Siberian land bridge where they were domesticated about 5,000 years ago and, you know, became a significant part of uh, civilized cultures uh, in Eurasia. And eventually, once the uh, North America was sort of quotes on quotes off discovered, <laughs> even though it was occupied by, you know, hundreds of different advanced First Nations civilizations and cultures. Um, the Spaniards were, the Vikings actually brought the first horses to uh, the Newfoundland area in uh, probably a thousand BC, but they they didn't expand from there. And uh, so the first horses were brought back or returned to North America, as you might say, biologically, by Cortez and the Spaniards in the early 1500s. And from there, these uh, Spanish Iberian horses, the horses of conquest, were, um, you know, were raised on different ranches. They escaped. Uh, uh, some of the Spanish expeditions got lost and were wiped out by First Nations, who then, you know, discovered this amazing animal and and took them, absorbed them into their culture. So eventually, um, the horses were spread across the Americas. Um, by indigenous cultures and reached the northern Rockies and what's now Alberta and the interior BC by the <laughs> early to mid 1600s and became integral parts of um, indigenous cultures in the grassland ecosystems. And so the, these horses, which are classified today uh, as alien uh, domestic feral species have been living in our ecosystem for over 400 years, and um, the last, and because of the um, once settlers moved in with cattle and agriculture started, the, they felt the horses had to go along with the grizzly bears, the wolves, anything that competed with cows, and so in BC with colonialism, the first. Uh, act to eradicate wild horses was passed by the colonial government in the late uh, 1800s and that sort of set off a massive eradication programs. So today we have, you know, a lot of wild horses still survive in the United States, but we have only about 5,000 left in Canada. And of course, the Chilcotin has the largest number, about 2,800, and the Alberta foothills have about you know, 13 to 1500. And so that's just part of the storyline in my book. You know, that's how the horses got here. And then so many other stories radiate out from there, including their genetics and the fact that in the Alberta and foothills and the BC Chilcotin, the original bloodlines, the Spanish Iberian horse bloodline, uh, still survive. Uh, so, which is kind of ironic, but a beautiful thing, you know, that those horses have retained most of their original bloodline for 400 years. I thought that that was one of the more interesting, or at least one of the parts of the book that I had no idea about that, because I had always learned that horses were just introduced into North America or Americas more generally with European uh, colonialism, as you were saying. And it's with your book that I kind of found out that, you know, this whole cyclical element of their existence had occurred. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I immediately told my partner about it, who loves horses. Um, and yeah, she she was equally enamored by that fact. And thank you very much for uh, elaborating on that. But I want to pick up on one of the points that you had brought up, which is the fact that in the relatively modern period, we'll say since the 19th century, a lot of these horses have been actively hunted. Um, and there was a major period in the 19th century when that was happening. Um, but listeners might be interested to know that this is not something that remained in the past. You have a whole chapter, for example, on uh, that you call the 1988 bounty hunt, which 
a lot of listeners will have been alive during this particular period. So it's not that long in the past. And even earlier this year, there were, um, I think it was 17, 16 or 17 wild horses that were killed up in BC. Um, and can you provide a little bit more background on these more contemporary events of killing these horses? Um, why it happened and perhaps how it indicates a wider need for their protection now more than ever. Yeah, well, it's a fascinating uh, chapter in the history of our wild horses because there used to be tens of thousands that ran free across our prairies and interior BC grasslands and Alberta foothills because the way the First Nations husbanded, they didn't have corrals, they didn't um, cut hay in the winter. So they relied on the, the horses to survive in the wilds. And when they needed horses, they just went out and helped themselves to what they considered to be the best, you know, the best stocks for their their needs. And so the chapter on range wars, which has lasted over a century, you know, it's still going on, but it's going on in a different form. And in the past, it was just, um, you know, the government would pay a bounty on horses and the Mustangers would go out and round them up and shoot them and cut the, the scalp off between their ears and turn them in and get paid. And eventually it just morphed. The last shoot off was actually 1988 in, in our study area. I found that out from the old trapper, Lester Pierce, who actually did the bounty hunt. You could tell when he told me he was not very happy about it and pointed out a hillside where he shot the last mare. And, and interestingly, the horses have never come back in that valley. They seem to have memories like elephant memories. So this is recent times. 1988 isn't too long ago when we still had a bounty hunt. In the Alberta foothills, it's now, they call them calls. They had the last one was in 2015, where um, several hundred horses were, were removed. Uh, some were put up for adoption. Uh, some apparently went to slaughter. And then in 1985, the last prairie horses that lived in the Suffield military base in Alberta, which is sort of a last prairie area in that area. And the horses had been there for a long time. We don't know how far back they go there because genetic studies were never done, but it was very controversial. There were cattle allowed grazing on the military block and this committee was formed. And eventually the, the head uh, of the military just said, okay, just made a decision. They're going to have to go. So. Uh, well over a thousand were removed just like that uh, at the drop of a hat. Apparently some went to slaughter, some were, uh, you know, taken by ranchers and stuff. So we lost that. That's again in recent times. And all of this is happening because both the BC and Alberta government still manage this return native species as a non-native uh, uh, feral domestic livestock. They treat it just like cattle or sheep or goats, uh, barnyard animals, which were raised <laughs> in barnyards. They're treating these horses that have been out there for four centuries as a return native species evolved in North America as a barnyard animal. It's very convenient because it allows them to uh, do population re removals and so-called humane calls on, in BC under the BC Livestock Stock Act in Alberta under the Stray Animals Act. <laughs> so they treat these uh, um, 1,500 horses that live in the Alberta foothills and have been there for a long time as stray animals like they would somebody's uh, uh, goat or sheep or something that wandered out of the barnyard and was trying to run wild. And there's no, so there's no real provincial or federal, federal legislation that recognizes that these are a distinct species. They're not wildlife. They're not domestic animals anymore. They're a special heritage species that's an uh, integral part of indigenous and our cultures and um, live out there with the wild predators in BC and Alberta and a, a very special animal that needs a separate designation as in the U.S. Uh, Wild Horse and Burrows Act that protects them as a heritage um, 
animal that lives in the wilds. And if you look at the our uh, Federal Endangered Species Act, uh, sometimes uh, scientists even claim that they could be declared uh, uh, registered under the COSIWIC guidelines and be declared a threatened species because so many of them had been eradicated. So the 17 horses that were shot in, not in the Chilcotin, but a small herd west of Kamloops, BC, uh, a year or two ago, uh, somebody just murdered them on the range and left them there to, you know, dead. And uh, the person was never prosecuted. The RCMP livestock officer didn't investigate, but there's no really strong laws even, you know, for the, for the law enforcement agencies to go out there and actually prosecute someone. The people who don't like wild horses or feel they're competing with their cows and stuff who just pick up a gun or set out a snare to eliminate them, they know they can get away with that. So that's partly why I write the, wrote the book, because when I realized how important these animals were to uh, the ecosystems and to indigenous people and to our culture, and to the whole of society that uh, I went, wow, you know, things are going to have to change here because if this keeps on, we may uh, reach a point, as with the Suffield horses on the military block, where somebody just decides they go have to go and they're all of a sudden go all gone at the wink of an eye. I, I just wanted to pick up on two of the points that you had mentioned here. First of all, their relation to the ecosystem and uh, how Indigenous people have uh, engaged or interacted with these particular horses. Um, and throughout the book, let's start with the ecosystem aspect here. You do make a link between um, the wild horses of the Chilcotin and global climate issues, right? Um, now, often listeners or readers might think that made many of the climate issues that we're facing today are related to uh, extractive land policies, for example, or agricultural practices or oil and gas, and all of that is really important. Uh, but can you say a little bit more as to how uh, our relation with uh, these horses or how these horses live does have a relationship to uh, climate issues and the ecosystem? Well, there are several um, sides to that that issue. Well, one is that uh, some of the studies of how uh, carbon is sto stored in grasslands and soils, 40% of the earth carbons is, you know, a lot of carbon is stored in, in grasslands throughout the world. Uh, native grasslands are very important to um, absorbing and storing carbon, especially in the upper soil layer. And one study in Alberta uh, looked at uh, some mild grazing by livestock and found that, you know, wild grazing um, resulted in greater storage of carbon. Heavier grazing, of course, reduces the carbon in the upper soil layer. And if you look at the, the way horses digest their food and, and drop, leave droppings all over the range, they're, they're converting grass in, into more disposable carbon that then goes back into the soil and sort of helps fertilize it and store carbon. The negative side of climate change, as we saw with the big uh, 2003 wildfire in our uh, Brittany Triangle and what became the, the Eagle Lake Henry Wild Preserve was, you know, the fires are becoming more frequent, they're becoming more uh, intense. Um, we, we found our two, well, at least our study bands after the 2003 fire just disappeared. And I found where I think one that had survived what we called the chestnut stallion band, uh, so much of the forage had been burned off and it was a deep snow winter after the fire that they appeared to have starved to death. Another fi fire in the same area in the Wild Horse Preserve in 2017 was what you call a Holocaust fire. You know, the fire just took off uh, huge hurricane force winds and, you know, it's like a firestorm going into the sky, I gather from people who were there. And uh, my book has a gruesome picture of a, a herd of uh, nine or 10 horses, including foals that were trapped uh, by that fire. They couldn't, no matter how the horses ran, they couldn't escape the fire. And so they were all killed. 
So there's, uh, you know, two sides to this story here. And I think what, what people really need to become aware of is we really have to reduce our carbon emissions at home, in our work, and all over, you know, we just can't keep uh, having conferences and political promises and, uh, and not uh, all join forces and in every way we can, including stopping flying to um, nice warm climates in the winter in, in jet planes and stuff, you know. So the planet and, and societies are already paying a huge price. And if we don't get on top of it, you know, it's just, it's scary. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it just goes to show also how, you know, something that not a lot of people are aware of, such as wild horses, can have extremely widespread impacts, right? We often like to talk about cars and all of that. And again, that's important. But you know, the way in which we treat um, different animals, right, whether it's one species or all of them, all of this has an impact, and I really want to emphasize that particular point. Um, yeah, well, one, one of the roles, just to add something important here, yeah. that I, one of the role, reasons the military liked the horse in uh, Suffield, uh, CFCB Suffield yeah, in yeah. southeast Alberta, is they kept the grasses grazed down and reduced the threat of wildfires to their military facilities. So once they got rid of the horses, um, the grasses came back uh, and they had a bigger fire hazard and were really worried. So what they did is they reintroduced elk <laughs> and the elk multiplied to be larger numbers <laughs> than <laughs> the horses. <laughs> and so now they're having to deal with that. So, you know, that, I, think, I think they realize, I hope they realize now that <clears throat> should never got rid of the horses in the first place because they really did fu fu fulfill a eco ecological role in keeping the soil healthy. There was some evidence of, of uh, damage to the riparian areas from a rain study, but overall they weren't having a big impact. So yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add that. Oh, for sure. I, I shouldn't laugh because it is very serious, but it is really absurd. So I can't help myself, but uh, yeah, thanks for Thanks for that addition. Um, you Something else you brought up in a previous answer is uh, the role that uh, Indigenous people have to play in, um, in understanding or better relating to these wild horses. And it's something that you emphasize in the book as well, right? Uh, the need for Indigenous wisdom and understanding the issues that um, we're facing or the horses are facing today. So can you explain a little bit more what you... Um, what you emphasize in the book and perhaps how wild horses have played a history, uh, have played a role, sorry, in Indigenous history or his be history in general in British Columbia. Well, part of my journey into the uh, Chilcotin and Indigenous relationship to the horse, um, it didn't happen right off the bat, even though, mm -hmm. you know, I was working with some of the Chilcotin wildlife researchers um, and uh, eventually one of their lawyers said, it finally took me aside, he said, Wayne, you need to start listening to the elders because you're doing all this, you know, scientific study of the wild horses, but you're not listening to the elders enough about um, about their indigenous knowledge and their, their relationship to the horse and their history and so on. <laughs> he literally shook me um, because as yeah. a scientist, you get sidetracked. So I did. I started listening to the elders, listening to their stories. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, when I started incorporating their knowledge and their legends and stories into my book, I hired a Chilcot knowledge keeper and wildlife researcher I work with, Alice Williams, to make sure that it was all accurate because all you have to do is have one word, word out and you misportray you know, the real yeah. meaning of their relationship and history. And so as I built that storyline into the book and combined it with Western science, it just <clears throat> grew and grew. It was really, really fascinating um, to um, on a big learning curve for me. Um, it was it, it was wonderful. And, and um, 
but it was it was complicated and they would have to sometimes go and check with some of their other elders to make sure that what they were giving me was accurate because they have lost some of their history through smallpox academics and residential schools and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me a minute, I got to clear my throat when I talk too much. No worries. Yeah, and returning to that topic, they, um, when you go out with um, some of these knowledge keepers, uh, walk the wild horse trails and stuff, the they carry their whole history with them. So there'll be uh, an ecological, biological layer to the landscape that as a biologist and, and, and as wildlife research of myself and the Chilcotin were aware of. But when you go out there and hear their stories as you're walking along um, where they used to hunt and where their villages used to be, they lay over the land a whole cultural layer that you're you're not aware of as a, as a white person and it enriches your whole experience of being out there in horse country because you the whole you get um you have these two biological and cultural heritage layer from their oral history going on all the time and so i try to integrate those two layers into my book as best i can it's not an easy task for people who might be listening um you know as as someone who's also trying to do something similar with his own doctoral research, like managing these different writing styles and these different approaches in ways that is still coherent, right, is can be a, a rather daunting task and can take many years of, you know, actual thought uh, before writing anything down. So really, I, in this case, I commend you very much on managing to do that. And I think a really interesting way, personally. Um, but just out of curiosity, is this a practice of reaching out to Indigenous elders that you're going to try to integrate into other work that you're doing outside of the one with uh, wild horses, or does it not necessarily apply to other uh, other work? Well, I've been working with uh, First Nations people on wildlife issues and conservation issues for well over 50 years, and what you you'll go. see in my book. In the 1980s, I was doing caribou surveys for a pipeline study in the northern Yukon. And one of our caribou spotters was an elder called Charlie Peter Charlie, who around the campfire one night told us the story, their story of the oral history of the mastodon, <laughs> which turned out to be true. And when I worked on saving, researching uh, our white Kermode spirit bear on the BC coast, um, I talked to elders and I integrated uh, their legend of the spirit bearer into my work there, which uh, is a story that goes back to the Ice Age. And one of the more fascinating pieces of work I did was uh, on a huge valley called the Kitlop Valley near Kitimat, which was threatened by logging. And I was hired by um, the Heisla Nation, the Heisla Hanaxwa, to look at grizzly bears and also deal with the grizzly bear hunting there. And my uh, terms of reference were set by six of the elders. <laughs> and so when I would go out with them, they would give me their storylines and tell me their stories about grizzly bears and stuff. And I would integrate, began integrating that with my science. And so I've been doing this for a long time. And so when I started working on wild horses writing my book i had a lot of background and let's say quotes on quotes off training from native elders <laughs> as to how to listen to them and how to accurately represent their storylines and because like i say it's so easy to misinterpret it and, and then write it down and not have it properly um integrated after they created the wild horse preserve there was a large area still in their territory that was unprotected and still open to logging and mining. And I did a, a whole biological study with two uh, knowledge keepers from two different Chilcotin bands. And we blended um, their knowledge with Western science to create this uh, report that, uh, and now the uh, Chilcotin have created another big protected area as an indigenous uh, protected conservation area. So. By wedding the two, you can accomplish a lot more and help them protect the planet uh, with certain First Nations. 
Yeah. And it's so, so important. Yeah, for sure. And even now, oh, with, yeah. uh, with my professional association, uh, we have to take a whole, there's a whole training manual on how we, uh, how we can best work with First Nations and incorporate their knowledge into our professional work. So that's the modern Very interesting. way of. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Um, and I want to pick up on this idea of the protection areas and generally talk about conservation. Um, so obviously this is a underlying or sometimes directly mentioned part of the book, but you brought it up in some of your answers as well as that there has been a move towards creating protected areas for um, these horses. But you know, what kind of other uh, conservation modes are trying to be implemented? Is it just protection areas or is it something that goes beyond that in kind of the quest to uh, to save these wild horses? And what are some of the challenges that might be faced in trying to provide some of these conservation practices? Well, um, it just depends where, where you go in uh, Canada. The Sable Island horse is about 500 on Sable Island, off in Nova Scotia, they're protected today under a national park reserve, even though it's not a really horse country or where they evolved. Sure. Parks Canada has recognized them as a quotes on a naturalized species. In Saskatchewan, a small herd is being protected provincially under the Bronson uh, Forest uh, Provincial Act. However, there the habitat is not protected, and secondly, the act is not enforced, so those horses are having a hard time. Um, the Alberta foothills uh, horses, they live in a very modified landscape with oil and gas development, uh, lots of cattle grazing, uh, lots of uh, off-highway vehicle use by ATVs and stuff, and um, there, I think, are where the horses in Canada are facing the biggest challenge because there's really um, not a lot of initiatives there to protect the habitat. And the groups who are advocates for protecting the horses are having a real hard time trying to stop the last, you know, some more calls from happening. Um, the Eagle Lake Henry Cayuse Wild Horse Preserve in BC Chilcotin, that the Hunnigatine Chilcotin First Nations created. It's um, well over a million uh, acres in size. It's totally intact. It encompasses different sort of horse regimes, um, major salmon spawning areas, grizzly bears. It's significant from a global perspective. And yet the provincial and federal governments haven't recognized that yet. You know, the provincial government probably still wants to log it and uh, there's still mining interest there. So, so that politically a lot needs to happen where we can get these areas fully protected. And even where BC, where there's a move now to protect indigenous protected areas, there are different uh, definitions on that. And unless those have in my mind, also legislated protection, where you're wedding these protected interests with strong provincial legislation that prevents those areas from being logged or other mining happening where the mining company might move in and, and, and throw a bunch of jobs at First Nations to get them to agree to mining. So um, <clears throat> I believe that an area is not protected until it's fully protected by both levels of society, indigenous people who are part of the protection and the governance and provincial and federal legislation we have for fully protecting areas, whether it's the National Park Act or the Provincial Park Acts we have in, say, BC and Alberta. Right. So shifting towards some of the last questions that I have here, this is a book that's many years in the making. I think in the introduction, you mentioned 20 years or so um, that you've been working on this particular project and then turning it into a book. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what are some of the uh, changes or uh, that happened either in your perspective on this issue between its first inception and how it came out uh, or even how uh, some of the 
uh, events that you depict it has new information come out about it that you know happened over the research that had you changed the particular um, uh, shape of the book in essence I'm curious how this whole book came into being and what changed uh, over its production because I always find it fascinating what an author goes through in creating what is a, ostensibly a final product but always in the making I find yeah, that's a whole another story, um, Patrick. <laughs> After I had uh, the dream about the uh, stone horse, the, uh, this strange dream, um, and then after we had this beautiful experience in our first year of being charged by a black stallion, I, st I, I wrote those down in my personal diary. And after Out of that, as I more than I learned about the horses, I, the book just started writing itself. And even though at times I thought, why am I doing this? You know, I've got other things to do. And um, it just it just was like this uh, this shoot that, that like shoots come up through the soil after the snow goes in the spring that kept insisting that it's going to keep coming and growing. Even sometimes I tried to push it away. Uh, why would I, why do I want to write a book about wild horses? And so it just grew and grew, and either through dreams that sometimes I wake up in the morning, I just see things I hadn't seen before, and I would start writing them down. And I realized I was writing chapters of, of a book, not knowing what was going to be in it, where it would go, where it would end. I found my biggest challenge, because I'm a technical writer, a professional biologist, I have to publish papers. Um, I'm a polished technical writer and have produced, you know, probably a hundred professional reports and scientific papers. So I found the biggest challenge for me was <clears throat> it's easy to get the science down and write down details, but to actually uh, write it in a more popular format that, as uh, one of my editors said, you need to write it, write the book so your uncle who knows nothing about wild horses and only has a grade three education can relate to what you're trying to say. And so that was sort of my guiding principle. It was um, probably the biggest challenge was learning to, to write that way, to write it in a format that would not only bring all the science and all the knowledge from First Nations, and the genetics and, and stuff to the public, but in a way that it would touch them, that would reach their hearts emotionally and intellectually, which I think is uh, the hallmark of a successful book when I look back. But it's some, to some people, I think they're born writers and born poets and born artists. I wasn't born that way. I was a born scientist. So the transition late in my life has been uh, complicated, but extreme. Yeah. And I think just to, to piggyback off of that, I think your choice to begin with the chapter, the stone horse is I think a good indicator of the style that you decided to take, right. Of talking about this wider issue, but still relating it through personal experience and through a very personal voice um, in many ways. And I thought that was a very interesting and apt choice to go through while still making it uh, approachable and have your audience kind of understand the, as you were saying, more scientific and you know, type of writing that has a tendency to be dry. Um, I'm not going to be too critical about it, but it does have that tendency sometimes uh, when you read like more scientific papers. But I think you managed to bridge that gap uh, very, uh, very, very well. And you you notice that right in the first chapter, I feel. Yeah. Uh, well, um, there's some chapters like evolution yeah. or genetics where you, you have to explain the science and you're going to have a dry run. You know, it's like if you're hiking out in the grasslands uh, on a day hike to enjoy things, you're going to have some steep hillsides to go up or you might step on a cactus or something. You know, it's uh, just part of the journey. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It kind of weeds out of different, different emotional and factual experiences. It's like a fabric or weaving i think yeah absolutely um and i'm always curious especially when i talk to people who ha who wrote on subjects that are more environmentally inclined um i'm always more curious to know 
what can someone who's not a professional biologist like yourself, who's not necessarily steeped in the conservation world, uh, is there anything that the average uh, Canadian or British Columbian can do in order to help with the um, issues that the wild horses are facing, right? if at all? I think there's lots that Canadians can do. Um, and I'm not only a biologist, I've been an activist uh, all my life. My professors at UBC, uh, Dr. Ian McCowan and a range ecologist, uh, they were activists. And they once Dr. Cowan said, there's even room for mavericks in, in the profession. And so they were my inspirations. Um, a lot of biologists I find are just interested in their study and feel that if they speak out, they're gonna <clears throat> not be viewed as objective. I think the opposite is true. That's been what you can still be professional objective and speak up for things. So I think for the average Canadian, um, once they become <clears throat> appraised about all the facts related to our horses and their history, um, believe me, it's uh, many, you know, it's an e easy sell to people because people love horses. They're the, mo they're the most beautiful animals in the world. And uh, how can you resist? But um, because of the politics and the biology, it can be very confusing for people. And I hope my book sets a lot of that history straight on straight and the true and narrow. And uh, <clears throat> I think what I hope is uh, to touch many Canadians, thousands of Canadians and people worldwide about these horses and protect them that will motivate people to contact the Federal Minister of Agriculture or the Alberta Minister of Agriculture or the Minister of Agriculture <clears throat> and just say, you know, we need legislation to protect these horses. I'm hoping that my book will stimulate, uh, you know, some of the horse uh, groups in Canada, like the Canadian Horse Defense League, and there's a new Indigenous group in Vernon, BC, <clears throat> to arm them with the information they need to uh, organize campaigns and stuff to finally get these wild horse protected. And it's a tricky thing because we have <clears throat> laws like our Federal Endangered Species Act, um, we still have species like our mountain caribou where I live here in the interior of BC going extinct because of loopholes in the act or because those acts are not enforced enough. And that's the whole problem with the US Wild Horse and Burrows Act, which is a, you know, a landmark act that was celebrated, but because of loopholes in the act <clears throat> that allowed uh, those horses to be rounded up, there's 50,000 50, wild horses in the U.S. kept in holding pens and costing million dollars to feed because they're protected so they can't um, do anything else with them. They're, you know, they're people have adopted thousands. And so we have, whatever we have to do has to be designed to make sure these horses are protected in the right way and there, that there aren't laws passed that don't really protect them in the proper way and maintain the health of these uh, last wild ecosystems. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that. And one of the last questions I always like to ask uh, whenever I have a guest who wrote a book is, is there anything in particular that you would like to highlight from this book? Um, if you want to read a passage or anything like that, that you feel represents your book in a meaningful or central way. Um, I always like to even if it's not a reading or just a mention of a particular passage, I always like to give authors the opportunity to do that if they so choose. Well, I like the chapter on uh, In Search of Old Bones, where my wife, Lorna Visser, and I uh, thought we would go down to the States and visit areas where um, horse fossils had been found and where there were paleontological museums. And that was uh, for me, because when you see old bones out in the range in the Chilcote and, you know, some covered with lichen, you realize every bone has a story to tell. Did that horse die from a cougar? Was it shot by a mustanger? What kind of life did that ho horse have? So real old bones on that journey were like the Hagerman horse in southern Idaho, uh, the replica of that in the... Uh, in the 
12 horse center they have in one of the small towns there. And then going out to a big lava dome cave in the Snake River Plains and going into that cave where First Nations uh, lived about 10,000 years ago and where, you know, horses of an old, old horse species, bones of old horse species were found. That all brings it home. It, it kind of brings the evolution of the horse into something that you can understand and relate to rather than just reading about it in a paleontological book or horse. And I like the way that chapter came together and where at the end of it, <clears throat> we went and stood and looked out over the Snake River Plains and the old, which was a huge lava area many years ago, you know, <clears throat> covered with sagebrush and stuff where all of this ancient history still lives and where the Shoshone First Nations used to run, have their horses there and horses you run free before they were eradicated. And it was there to me that the whole concept from other scientists that the horse was a, re a native species returned to North America really came home because you had the paleontological remains of the Hageman horse. You had the Wilson Butte cave with the more bones of a more remote species. You had the history of the Shoshone Indians having horses there running wild until a century or so ago. You know, all the pieces, that, you know, from millions of years ago to uh, a century ago, they all just came together and merged into this awareness. Is, yeah, they are return native species. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, and the last question I always ask to any guest, I don't include it. But what is something I didn't ask in this interview uh, that you would like to talk about? And what is the answer to that question? I think you've covered everything. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that always feels good to hear. <laughs> um, but honestly, Wayne, thank you very much for joining me today and for talking to us about uh, this really wonderful book. I always uh, am happy to recommend it. But for listeners who are interested in picking it up, I will be including links in the description of the show. Um, but is the book out yet uh, as of time of recording or is it soon to be released? No, no, the book's been out since um, October. It is now uh, number one on the BC Sellers book list. Um, it's selling like pancakes, I gather. There's a huge amount of local <laughs> Uh, I had an op editorial in the Globe and Mail last weekend, a whole page. Uh, the weekend before, I had a full page spread in the Vancouver Sun. One day I went on uh, CBC and syndication and spent four hours doing seven to eight mi minute interviews uh, to 14 stations across Canada. At the end, I felt like a zombie <laughs> repeating myself. <laughs> It, it will, it's apparently available on Amazon and it will be available in U.S. bookstores uh, until April and then not in Europe and the rest of the world until next year. So, yeah, so it's getting, the word is getting out there. And so I'm really happy that it's reaching some people. You know, yeah, wonderful. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um. But yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I, I just wanted to say congratulations. Sorry about that. Um, but congratulations on the success of the book. And uh, yeah, hope all the you know sales in Europe and elsewhere, honestly. Thank you very much for being here. Um, but yeah, sorry, uh, did you uh, have anything that you wanted to add? Well, I won't get rich or have a retirement off the book. I'm, I'm 81 years old and I don't intend to retire <laughs> as a bear biologist or with wild horses, because there's so much work to be done and I so enjoy my work. But I put 30,000 of my own money in my consulting, wildlife consulting company to the book for my own editors and for some layout and experimental things. And that's just all part of the journey, so. <laughs> Okay, we may have gone a little barbecue crazy at Sonic. We bbq fied not one, but three iconic menu items. But I mean, come on, can you really blame us for going slightly overboard? 
When you add smoked pulled pork and tangy cherry wood smoke sauce to a melty cheeseburger, a brioche topped barbecue sandwich, and crispy, cheesy tachos, you'd be crazy not to go crazy. Pulled pork barbecue, now at Sonic. Limited time only at participating Sonic drive ins. With the Planet Fitness Black Card, you don't just get a great workout, you get a great perk out. Because your membership is packed with perks. For $1 down and $24.99 a month, you'll get perks like access to any of our 2,400 clean and spacious locations. Bring your friend anytime and both work out with tons of equipment that'll give you that big fitness energy. Relax in the Black Card Spa and more. Work out and perk out with the PF Black Card. Join for just $1 down and $24.99 a month. See Home Club for details.